committee, um, the, um, the, weekly, the weekly meeting, and uh, especially welcome to anyone who's joining us uh, online. Um, so we, uh, the committee will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament Buildings and online. You can use your uh, mobile device as long as they are in airplane mode and um, are muted. Um, I got a message from Harry, Harry, Harvey, Harvey, the who's joined us here this morning. He may have to dip out at a number on a number of occasions and uh, to attend to other business. And should that happen, he wants to delegate his vote to William. Okay. So members, item number one on the agenda is uh, apology. I don't have any apologies noted. Um, item number two on the agenda is the multi-year uh, under chairperson's business. I have multi-year budget proposals. Page six of the pack is a briefing paper by the clerk in relation to the 22-25 uh, multi-year budget proposals, uh, which have been made by the department. And you'll be aware that the Minister for Finance has advised the Assembly that he is unable to bring forward the multi-year budget for debate. But nevertheless, the Committee for Finance has requested for our committee's views on DERA's plans to inform the future of future scrutiny. Nick, would you like to take the opportunity to brief the committee on this? Chair, thank you very much indeed. Yes, this is by way of follow-up members to the briefing we received on the 27th of January from officials in respect of DERA's spending plans over the multi-year budget period. And as Chair said, the Committee for Finance has requested um, our assessment of those plans. So there's a, a, a suggested report for members in the pack, uh, starting at page nine, um, page six, excuse me. So the paper sets out the indicative budgetary allocations for DERA over the course of the multi-year budget period, both in terms of resource and capital Dell, and outlines some of the anticipated uh, pressures, both in terms of resource and capital spending. So the paper outlines that DERA submitted applications to the Department of Finance seeking an additional £224 million over the course of the next three financial years and has been indicatively allocated only £51 million. And as we heard uh, during the briefing from officials, that's likely to have a number of implications for uh, projects that the department had planned to take forward. The first of those is which is highlighted in the paper is the funding for EU exit activities. So DERA had sought a total of approximately £33 million over the course of the draft multi-year budget period in order to facilitate the appointment of additional staff um, and other resource to carry out the requirements as per the protocol. However, only £1 million has been allocated each year, um, which raises uh, questions about the uh, ability of, of DERA to carry out its responsibilities. Um, and while it's noted that negotiations are ongoing about the potential revisions to the protocol, um, it is likely that there will be some ongoing need for additional resource. Uh, another cost pressure which is highlighted in the paper, uh, members will recall that was discussed, is that there's currently no funding allocated um, for projects to tackle rural poverty and social isolation, uh, despite a need of around £2 million per year. And the report outlines the committee's concern regarding this. Um, and while the department has advised the committee that it is hopeful of securing in-year funding for this initiative um, via the Treasury, I suppose there's a potential concern of, that there is a lack of certainty regarding provision of that funding. Also highlight this uh, quite a sizable shortfall in funding for the Environment Fund and Strategic Environmental Programme. So the department sought a collective bid of around £22 million for those initiatives for the next three years, and in return has been uh, allocated on just shy of £3 million. Um, and the committee understands that that will potentially impact a number of work streams related to the green growth and environment strategies, as well as the peatland strategies and any projects to be delivered via the Climate Change Act. In terms of capital pressures, the, the most substantive element is the green, uh, capital allocation for the Green Growth Strategy. Uh, members will recall that the Department submitted a bid for £600 million um, over the next three years and um, has been allocated at present only £175 million against those, um, against those bids. And while officials informed the committee that they were looking at the allocation positively, 
um, it is undoubtedly that this will hamper intended progress of the green growth strategy. Um, and that while the committee was told that the green growth strategy, um, the initial focus will be on policy development and that there will be a, a long-term resource requirement, um, it's likely that the progress will be hampered in the short term given the um, given that the full application has not been not been uh, supported uh, I've also included in the paper the rationale provided by officials um, in terms of the methodology that was used to determine the total of the 600 million pound bid um, and that the department advised us that this was an indicative profile based on the funding that business areas within the department felt would be required to reduce carbon and greenhouse gas emissions up until uh, the year 26-27. I've also highlighted that DERA, within the, the bid of £175 million, has allocated about 25% of that to continue uh, with funding for the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. Um, and to highlight the discussion that we had with officials on the 27th of January about whether that was um, an appropriate badging of that funding. I've also um, allocated uh, the committee's uh, discussion around the Green Growth Challenge Fund, which DERA has allocated £37 million to over the next, uh, next three years, which um, is designed to support projects and pilots to um, test solutions to help mitigate emissions um, and I suppose question the, ever, the, the methodology for allocating that level of funding given that there are well known solutions, uh, nature based solutions to help reduce carbon emissions. I've also highlighted a key capital pressure is the long term funding and respect for rural development policies particularly in year 24-25. Um, which is the last year when the Department will be able to claim EU match funding for existing schemes. Um, and I've also, at the, the Committee for Finance's request, included information about the anticipated costs associated with high-risk projects managed by the Department. And those are the ongoing out, uh, rollout of the Northern Ireland Food Animal Information System and DERA's Science Transformation Project. So, in summary, um, the report outlines that they identified a number of potential concerns regarding pressures within DERA's spending proposals for the next three years, including under allocations in respect of uh, revenue and capital funding for the green growth strategy, um, policy implementation in respect of climate change and environmental health, um, as well as potential challenges to meet its legislative and regulatory requirements. And there's also um, long-term uncertainty about the replacement of EU funding sources, particularly after, or particularly by year three of the draft budget period, when, as I say, DERA will no longer be able to claim match funding for the EU-backed initiatives. Um, so, Chair, that's a that's a, a summation of the consideration of the multi-year budget proposals, and I'm happy to take any comments or or questions on that. Thanks, that, Nick. Um, Nick, I wonder um, would be um, the committee be okay if we were to write to um, the the minister just for any update on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, because as we know, uh, following Brexit, we were told that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund would be there to replace the lost EU uh, funding. So um, I think it'd be important to keep the pressure on that. So could we just perhaps write to the department to find out, has there been any update on that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, particularly for the likes of the measures within the Rural Development Programme? Chair, sure, yes, indeed, absolutely. And um, by way of preparation for today's meeting, I, I did look at that uh, with the EU or excuse me, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, and there has been some new information released. So, yes, we will write to the department and seek clarity on what, how they intend to engage and secure funding against that. If I, if I could add, um, I'm not too sure what the process, what way the process works as regards the department seeking bids for, or does it lobby for, or what basically what's, how does it work to engage with uh, the UK government 
in regard to this prosperity fund. And then, well, first thing is, what is the prosperity fund? How do you make bids to it? And what way does the department or departments here in the north engage with it? Would be very important because it's yeah. it's almost live horse and you'll get grass type of approach at the minute. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that's a, a very valid point. Pots areas because I know there that was the UK Communities Renewal Fund that was more or less implemented over the head of the local um, devolved administration here. So I think that would be very important to get clarity in that. And I would definitely support what Pat suggested there. Thank you. Okay, members. Okay, members. Uh, the draft minutes. Uh, it's item number three in your agenda. It's um, draft minutes, page seventeen of the pack. Um, if you're okay, I'll sign them. I'm operating from the consistency today, but I'll sign them back up in Parliament Buildings and start a week again. So that's all right. Okay, members, uh, issues with uh, item number four is issues with plan applications. Further our discussion last week on the capacity issues relating to planning applications, the committee team has engaged with the department officials to attend our meeting, meeting on the 3rd of March to give an oral briefing on the matter. Okay, the um, organic egg sector uh, in your packs, you will see a response from the department to the queries you raised in November about the implications for the local organic egg uh, sector in terms of compliance with EU regulations. The department has confirmed uh, the, the department has confirmed that EU member states are able to seek derogations in respect of deriving poultry feeds exclusively from organic sources until 2026. It's unclear, however, if the North producers here will be able to do this. The regulations require poultry to have open air access to one third of their lives, and DERA is assured that local producers are compliant with this. Organic and non organic production units must be kept in separate housing for the duration of production. Um, there are also, uh, the letter also confirms that the new EU regulations are complex and there is currently no mechanism for local institutions to receive updated guidance on these matters. Also, DEFRA officials have indicated that the, the Britain has currently no plans to adopt any of the new EU organic regulations, so therefore there's likely to be divergence in organic standards between here and Britain and certain uh, disparities may occur in relation to the internal UK market. Can I ask um, um, for their views, um, you know, and perhaps we should reply highlighting our concerns about the potential impact to local producers and we need assurance that DERA will communicate issues regarding divergence via appropriate common frameworks. Members, any particular views you want to come in? Yeah, Declan. Yes. It, yes. it was me that first asked that. I was asked by um, by a constituent in relation to that. It's yeah. disappointing that sort of they, that their needs are not being met because they mm -hmm. seem to be just such a small niche group of people, these organic uh, poultry farmers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I do have concerns for their future. You know, yeah. what markets are they going to access? Only the GB market? Yeah. So, Rosemary, are you content that we reply highlighting our concerns about yeah. the potential impact? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would agree fully with that. I think that while it is a small and it is a niche market, it's important that we try and protect that market. Of course. The, the yeah. Yeah. And, come here, do you think we should maybe write to DERA as well, looking for clarity on processes um, was put in place to notify of any changes in the EU regulations as well, know to what processes they would have in place to notify yeah. producers about these? It, it se yeah, I would agree with you. It seems though, Declan, at the moment, that they've done very little to try and support mm -hmm. that or help that uh, yeah. group of farmers. There seems to be mm -hmm. very little comfort for them. Yeah, yeah. So listen, we will keep this on the agenda and write back to highlighting our concerns. Would that be okay, Rosemary? Yes, certainly. Yeah. No problem. And uh, thanks for raising it as well, Rosemary. Okay, members. Um, item number five, we're going to have an oil briefing mm -hmm. on the green growth strategy. Um, we were due, due to receive a briefing today on the proposed way forward in respect of the green growth uh, strategy. And as you'll be aware, the future direction of these policies will be influenced by the outcome of the debates on the climate change legislation. And the absence and the absence of a functioning um, executive and multi-year budget plan, the ability to confirm future strategies is very limited. However, officials are attending today.
to update members on the active green growth work streams and the work undertaken to develop the strategy to date. The background paper is in your pack at page 29. And I want to welcome uh, the following officials to the meeting from the department. Um, and I invite them to brief us as Aaron Wright, the Director of Green Growth and Climate Action Division of DERA, uh, Lisa Jane McElveen, Head of Green Growth Branch DERA, and uh, Judith Wilson, Green Growth uh, Division DERA. So uh, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Um, thank you for your attendance and maybe invite you to do your presentation and members will then want to ask some questions. Have we are they on the Starleaf yet? Yes, they're talking about the housing executive. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here now? Chair, I've been advised that uh, it's not a technical issue from our end. I can see Aaron uh, trying to speak there. I wonder perhaps if um, other officials can speak to see if we can hear them. Hello, can you hear yes. me? Yes, Judith, we hear you. Yeah, does, does Judith or Lisa Jane want to kick off there? Because Aaron seems to be not be able to tune in here. We can't hear. Um, if you're happy enough, I can start reading the, the, the oral briefing. Yeah, if that's okay with you. Judith, Aaron, yeah. do you want to try one last time? And then if not, I can go on ahead. Final call, Aaron. No. Okay. Um, I can read um, Aaron's opening remarks to you. Mm -hmm. um, so please bear with me. These are Aaron's. So I'm um, taking it from his perspective. On behalf of the team, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to meet with you and to give you a brief overview of our journey so far with Green Growth. The briefing paper provided outlines the key areas I intend to cover in my introduction, including what is meant by Green Growth, the importance of strategic and policy alignment, how we have approached developing the strategy, and the investment planning underway to support its delivery. I also intend highlighting some of the key work streams and inputs associated with the development of the strategy and also the wider work of the division. It is, however, important to set this work in context, and that means recognising that green growth is a completely new area of policy. Minister Putz began sharing his plans for a green growth approach just before the first lockdown in March 2020. From that point on, I, Aaron, have been building a team to progress this work while attempting to understand how it will impact on other departments, policy areas and people, and develop structures and relationships that will enable effective collaboration. It is also important to recognise the other significant pressures impacting the economy and society here during this time and the competing priorities for all departments in terms of budgets and resources. Despite this, Minister Putz made clear in his statement to the Assembly in June 2020 that tackling climate change would remain a priority for his department, and so we have continued to build capacity and capability to progress this work. So what is green growth? Our draft strategy states simply that green growth means recognising and accepting the impact we have on our planet and doing something about it. The climate and environment challenges we face are symptoms of how we live and work, and addressing these challenges will mean fundamental changes for society, for businesses, and for how government needs to function. We need to be outcome focused and mission driven. Such change demands having a shared vision for our future and collaborating effectively to get there. It means aligning policies and strategies to maximise the gains and minimise the unintended consequences. It also means taking a historic approach and balancing climate action with environmental improvement and developing a more sustainable economy. 
and doing this in a way that benefits everyone and doesn't ostracise any section of society. The view of green growth has been framed by months of research and significant engagement with a broad range of stakeholders, including businesses and their sectoral representative bodies, the voluntary and community sector, youth organisations and colleagues in local and central government, both here and in other devolved administrations and in the Republic of Ireland. I have already mentioned the importance of strategic alignment and slide four in Annex B of your briefing pack illustrates the range of executive and departmental strategies that impact on realising the green growth vision. It also shows the importance of a collaborative cross-cutting approach and hints at the complexity of the task. Many of the strategies highlighted are focused on things other than climate and environment outcomes, but they all impact the climate and environment to some extent. And it is therefore crucial that they have a shared understanding of what is acceptable and what is not. This is essentially the basis for what the draft strategy refers to as the green growth test. Though not yet defined, it will be a mechanism to assess the potential impact of strategies or policies on the delivery of green growth outcomes and inform prioritising budgetary and resource allocation. Developing an executive strategy means widespread collaboration and that requires buy-in from across all departments. To achieve this, we have established a number of groups that would provide the insight, the influence and the government's needed, governance needed. To date, these include an inter-ministerial group representing five departments, a strategic oversight group of senior, senior officials representing all departments and within DERA, a senior leadership group of policy leads. Can I just check if anybody can hear me? Yes, I you, Aaron. Oh, good. Uh, I thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, leading off on that, Judith. Uh, apologies. I, I don't know what happened at this end. I, I went out, came back in again, and it seems to have cured things. So I appreciate that. Um, I, Judith, do you, do you want me to continue on from that point, or are you, you happy enough? Perfect. Thanks, okay. Aaron. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate you bearing with me on that. Uh, so, uh, an, ex uh, an external stakeholder group, uh, also known as the, the Green Growth Forum, uh, is, uh, a has been established with whom plans uh, can be shared and tested uh, and ideas, ideas generated. The group is largely limited to sectoral representative bodies, given the number of sectors involved, and it includes around 35 different organisations. The committee also represents an important voice uh, in the development of the strategy, and I welcome the contribution that members have made to early versions of the strategy framework document, and indeed the strategy itself. And slides six and seven of Annex B uh, in your packs illustrate uh, these structures. The draft strategy was agreed by the executive on the 21st of October uh, and launched for public consultation on the 26th of October for eight weeks. The consultation was designed to encourage feedback on, on key elements of the strategy, including the vision, the principles, the commitments and next steps. And the consultation was widely promoted and included webinar uh, information events for the public. Uh, for MLAs, for our Green Growth Forum, and a session for young people uh, facilitated by the, the Education Authority. And in all, over uh, 200 attended these events, which were accompanied by uh, extensive social media campaign and press adverts. Uh, in total, 122 responses were received to the consultation, uh, and a report is currently being finalised, which captures the key quantitative and qualitative insights to inform the final version of the strategy. Uh, while largely positive uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the uh, responses, uh, there will be changes needed to the strategy as a result of the feedback uh, we have received. While the strategy is still in development and the action plans which will flow from it uh, are yet to be determined, uh, investment will be required to deliver such transformation and it needs to be planned for. The Climate Change Committee advised that for Northern Ireland to achieve its contribution to the UK's sixth carbon budget will require a large and sustained increase in investment, adding around 1.3 billion annually by 2030. They acknowledged that the majority will come from the private sector, 
but that the public sector investment will be significant. On that basis, Minister Pitts asked for an indicative capital investment profile to be produced for DERA. Uh, this five-year profile built on the 21-22 capital expenditure allocation of 20 million. It involved policy areas putting forward proposals indicating those areas that were most likely to deliver towards green <coughs> outcomes and what potential investment would be required up to 2027. Slides eight and nine of Annex B provide further details, as does the written briefing in Annex A. I also provided the committee uh, with some uh, insight into these proposals at your meeting on the 27th of January um, on the draft 2022 to 25 budget allocations alongside our finance director. The committee will be aware also that uh, delivering capital investment requires additional resources and that the draft budget also included some provision for this. Just to conclude on some of the work streams that we have taken forward, developing green growth has involved establishing and aligning a number of branches and work streams. Initially, our work streams were focused on early strategy development around research, engagement and building capacity around the governance structures that we refer to and also coordination to support machinery of government. In November 2020, the Climate Change Unit uh, also joined the green growth, uh, bringing a range of policy functions required under UK climate change legislation for both mitigation and adaptation. In the past year, special staff resource from Strategic Investment Board have also joined our team to bring both the capacity and expertise necessary to progress the st strategy development work. Uh, this has proved really invaluable, both in terms of their skill sets and their contacts and, credi and credibility within other departments uh, who are key to achieving the collaboration needed. And finally, as a division, uh, just to recognize you know, some of the achievements in the last 18 months or so, uh, you know, we, we have started from uh, uh, you know, zero and built an effective team, uh, developed a new area of policy in DERA. Uh, we've established an understanding of green growth among NICS and external stakeholders, and indeed many of the, uh, the, the, the uh, sister strategies across NICS you know, will refer to and have embedded in the you know, references to green growth and the importance of linking up. We've managed in Northern Ireland's involvement in the present and presence at COP26. Uh, we've maintained uh, the Northern Ireland commitments around UK climate change legislation. Uh, we've established effective processes to support machinery of government regarding green growth and climate change and developed governance structures to progress the strategy. We've produced and consulted uh, on an executive agreed draft strategy and coordinated future capital bids to support delivery of green growth in DERA and monitored and reported on these uh, in year allocations. So Chairman, I hope that this gives the committee some insight into the development of green growth as a policy area and as a division and a flavour of the work streams involved and the progress made to date. So uh, Chair, that concludes my opening remarks. Um, we're happy to take questions and, and thanks again to Judith for stepping in there. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And Thank you, Judith, for stepping into the great short notice there. Um, the number of members want to ask questions, but I suppose one of the, one of the things that maybe I'd like to ask of you is you made reference there in one of the streams is the agricultural uh, mitigation uh, program, um, and I, ju I just was curious to know: um, w does that or, or will that program sit within? One of the work, one of the streams of the future agriculture strategy, like the the farm for nature, or the or the carbon farming schemes, will it sit within some of those streams, or is it this does it sit separately uh, from the future agriculture policy? Uh, well, the, the the mitigation work that that, that I referred to um, uh, is is really linked into you know the monitoring reporting uh, around. Uh, UK Four Nations Board uh, around mitigation actions, uh, linking into the UK's uh, net zero um, uh, strategy. So there, there's a, a series of, of uh, you know monitoring reporting that has to be done there, and that's uh, that, that's what that team does. In terms of wider mitigations, um, I mean uh, the the Future Ag policy uh, does attempt to address a lot of mitigations uh, within that area. 
um, it will help, yes, absolutely deliver towards uh, Northern Ireland's um, you know, decarbonisation going forward. Um, but uh, it's one of a number of areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Aaron. Um, I'm going to move around the room here. Patsy? Yes, uh, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Chair, and, and thank you for your presentation. Um, could I ask just, there's a number of sort of consequential, we'll start with the money first of all, um, is there any implication of the budget not been agreed for the green growth strategy? And then we'll maybe move on, if you like, around the room uh, to follow, um, and I'm listening very carefully as to what you're talking about, the climate change unit joining with you. Um, the green growth investment or the green growth strategy, is that being seen at the department as a substitute either in part or in whole for the just transition as is envisaged in the um, legislation that's currently going through. So we'll, we'll maybe park those two. Then I'll move on to the wider aspects of it. Uh, I presume that you're liaising with Invest NI on, on part of these matters. And um, there's, there was a document produced, or rather a policy produced fairly recently, last year. It's called a 10x Economy Northern Ireland's Decade of Innovation. Now, um, looking at agriculture and mitigation programmes, green infrastructure and the likes of that, quite a bit of that would be rural based. Now, from what I can see of the general thrust of that policy or priorities for the Department for Economy, it seems to be primarily urban based, those types of industries that they're seeking to attract. And I'm just wondering how, if you like, a policy at one department is maybe, how should we pull it, pull in a different direction to what the general laudable aims of what this green growth investment might be. And then leading on from that, um, if I could ask you, have you tic tac with your colleagues at Invest NI around the pause that exists to investment uh, and to um, business support at the moment um, that they have as a consequence of the ERDF, principally ERDF funding, not been there. So there, there's a number of questions there around um, policy, policy overlaps or policy potentially contradictions that, that could be there that need to be, if you like, ironed out uh, in terms of where the green growth is going as opposed to where the thrust of overall economic policy may be going. So uh, if, you could, uh, if you have any thoughts or views on that, please. Uh, Thank you very much. We uh, we have uh, certainly been working very closely um, with our colleagues in DFE, and particularly uh, in relation to um, the uh, in and around the the 10x uh, strategy, but also uh, in terms of the en the energy strategy uh, and action plans that, that are being produced there. It's important to also point out that uh, our reference, uh, the, the initial reference to just transition is something that's a, a focus uh, very much in the green growth strategy. Um, I mentioned, uh, or maybe Judith mentioned actually in, in my uh, opening remarks, that uh, the, the aim is to transform society uh, and the economy away from the kind of reliance on fossil fuels and, and, and some of the maybe less sustainable uh, elements of the economy. Um, and in doing that, it needs to be done in a way that minimizes the, the negative impacts uh, you know, across society. So just transition is a core tenet uh, of, of green growth uh, as a strategy. Um, in terms of uh, linking with Invest, uh, we, we work very closely with Invest. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, how we can uh, look at the, the, some of the green growth uh, approach with the you referred to the challenge and innovation uh, in, a, in an earlier uh, session uh, there. And I just wanted to say that part of what we're trying to do is to look at how that kind of challenge and innovation that will bring a focus to decarbonizing or environmental improvement uh, or more green jobs, more sustainable economy base. Uh, there are a number of challenges that uh, you know, different sectors want to see solved, uh, whether that is in terms of storage, uh, of electricity uh, from renewable sources, uh, production from renewable sources, or whether it's uh, tackling some of the of the nutrient, uh, you know, challenges that 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 reside in the agri sector, or the challenges around retrofitting, 
Um, now, I think in terms of a green growth challenge and innovation fund, our proposal there is that uh, when we're identifying what the challenges are and the issues that we would, you know, that we need to see addressed uh, as government, that uh, you know, we're we're not the owners of all the good ideas. Uh, you know, business uh, and the community out there will come forward with potential solutions for that. And the idea of a green growth uh, innovation and challenge fund is to try and support, um, help those ideas get scoped out. And then potentially the winning, you know, the winning solutions are the ones that we feel are, are, are most likely to go forward, uh, you know, to try and de-risk those uh, so that they can be scaled up. Now, uh, there are a number of areas uh, and, uh, you know, it qu quite potentially uh, Invest NI could be heavily involved in, in targeting and, and uh, delivering of, of that scheme whenever uh, it, it, it comes to the fore. Well, maybe get back to my question. Uh, the questions were around the budgetary challenges, um, the issues, uh, the, the challenges or potential contradictions with the 10x strategy, um, and then leading on from that is the, the whole issue of Invest NI and the challenges that have been faced there because of ERDF funding. Have any of these issues been discussed or raised or, or even regarded as being an issue? Because I see them potentially very important issues and challenging issues and uh, especially the funding ones. Yeah, um, some of those issues uh, w will need to be discussed uh, a lot more. Uh, they're, they're not ones I have to uh, put my hand up and say in relation to ERDF. Uh, those are levels of discussions we haven't been having with uh, Invest. Um, in terms of future funding for uh, Green growth. Uh, you mentioned about the you know the reduction uh, in terms of allocation based on on what was being asked for. And I think we made it clear at, at, at the the meeting uh, whenever we were up with um, finance director that uh, you know a lot of what needs to be put in place uh, will be being done in terms of policies, um, scheme design, uh, program design. A lot of that will take some time uh, to work through. Um, we need to get the strategy uh, through. Uh, we need to get you know the action plans agreed, and we need to have the schemes flowing from that. So there's an element of uh, trying to uh, understand where the big areas are uh, that spend needs to occur, and then to build the structures around that uh, to, to get uh, the, the right funding out. So um, the funding shortfalls, yeah, that, that's definitely going to have uh, an impact and if you're asking me what that impact is at this stage I couldn't I couldn't be uh, I couldn't be clear as to exactly the level of impact I think the areas of policy development are, are things that are going to take some time to work through and the, those well, well chair maybe I don't want to labor this but clearly there's there's a lot of thinking has to be done at the department yet maybe with other external agencies including DFE and invest NI but I'm sure chair we, we can come back to this soon in uh, a wee while to, to refresh our, our thinking on it. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Patsy, I'm going to move over now to Philip. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks for the, the presentation. I mean, obviously, as you've stated, growth and climate uh, legislation are, are intertwined, so I'm just kind of wondering, given the evolution of the climate potential, legislation through the assembly i mean obviously uh there have been additions with regard to sectoral plans climate action plans uh just transition commissions climate commissioner and an office and uh some details with regard to plans and obviously the targets so i'm just wondering how that impacts on the work that you're doing in terms of the evolution of this strategy yeah, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, I, it's one that uh, I have to say has a has a huge impact uh, on the strategy. Uh, you'll be aware that uh, you know we we've been working on the strategy for some time. Um, we had to you know work on the basis that uh, the strategy would have to uh, stand alone uh, if that was going to be the case. But that uh, all along we said that whatever legislation. Uh, comes into place, we will need to align with that. Um, and you're quite right. Uh, there are a number of very significant changes that means that you know the strategy will have to to change accordingly. And that's one of the processes uh, that we're going through at this point in time is to try and understand exactly what uh, the amendments have been made 
uh, will mean, how they will impact uh, what we have. And obviously, we, we have, we've talked about, I mean, the, the positive things there is we, we, we've highlighted, uh, the executive agreed to uh, a just transition commission, uh, you know, uh, looking at a, uh, a, a, a citizens assembly uh, you know we've talked about uh, climate action plan being developed and worked up um, and yes the time scales around some of that have changed but uh, ultimately we'll need just to understand to what extent the departments uh, will be able to uh, work together to take it forward okay and then the other thing i mean you're saying that there was 20 million set aside it was likely that it was only going to be 10 million of that spent does that money carry over or is that lost to, to this strategy work and maybe could you identify some of the kind of projects that haven't uh, happened as a result of that uh, and then just kind of beyond that pot of money you, within the strategy you have identified four themes uh, agriculture mitigation program being one of them c c can you maybe give us a bit more detail of where you see that type of funding being used for that project and how would it be delivered and sort of on what basis would you apply for it? Okay, so the the, the first question just in, in and around um, the, the the spend uh, in year. So we have we expect to spend probably less than than uh, you know, than half of the of the twenty million. That will be across the range of of programs uh, that you've highlighted there. Those four areas. Uh, the money, I don't think, will necessarily be lost as such. Um, it it wasn't, certainly wasn't ring-fenced. Uh, it was something that can, can potentially be uh, redirected to other, uh, to other uh, areas of capital where, where required. Um, however, uh, going forward, I think the Agriculture Mitigations Program is a, is a number of different um, work streams uh, and, and around, uh, I guess, looking at um, you know, things like slurry, you know the, the the impacts of uh, um, methane from cattle. Uh, you know different uh, swords types and stuff like that. There, uh, you know, in terms of biodiversity within swords and and uh, means for sort of uh, carbon capture there. But but there are a range uh, of of areas. Um, soil nutrient health uh, being one of those mitigation areas. So uh, uh, Jude, I don't know if you want to maybe come in on that because I know you've been um, sort of leading the monitoring of that in your spend. That might be helpful. Yeah, of course. Um, so there was 13 projects funded through the 20 million pounds. Um, and of those 13 projects, actually the majority of them still had some funding element. It was just not 100%. So there was one project which did not have any funding, and that was a livestock genetics improvement uh, program uh, run through um, Food and Farming Group and CAFRI. So they returned all of their spend. There was also a number of issues where, with AFBI in that they were unable to purchase equipment through global supply shortages, um, issues with CPD, and um, uh, just getting equipment in place and being able to spend it throughout the year. So we had... The majority of the projects were able to spend, just not the full amount, which is currently just under £10 million pounds at the minute. Okay. And Chair, just briefly, the last question is, I mean, the, the other things, for example, green infrastructure, research and development, uh, marine blue carbon habitat, for example, they all are strong cross-border elements to them. So I'm just kind of wondering... Uh, what kind of are the all Ireland aspects of the Green Growth Strategy work? Uh, I know what kind of engagement there is with counterparts in the South. Yeah, there, there's been some engagement, um, certainly whenever we were trying to, uh, I suppose, understand, uh, you know, the approach that we were planning to take and how that related to a, uh, you know, a, a straightforward climate strategy. Um, taking this more balanced approach with with climate uh, environment and, and um, uh, you know the, the economy together going forward so there was a lot of engagement uh, with the, the department down there on that when I say the department I think it was uh, the department for climate down there uh, so we we've been working with them pretty closely um, in terms of how each of those uh, areas uh, those policy areas um, are, are engaged, what I will say is it would be for marine and fisheries to determine what was happening with 
you know that policy area um you know in uh, the republic um, and how the linkages are made so a lot of those policy areas will have uh, good contact and i know that uh, you know colleagues in, in, in um, food and farming group have close liaison with colleagues in DAFM on uh, future ag policy and what's what's happening there and we've got to remember that it's really those policy areas that are actually delivering the, these um, towards a, a coordinated uh, you know green growth outcomes so where are our outcomes that we're trying to influence the policy areas to focus in on uh, are those three areas that we're talking about bringing the balance into so um, on the ground, it's the policy areas that have direct contact with their colleagues in, in, in the Republic, and, and I know that's ongoing in, in many of the areas. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. No problem. John? John? Chair, you? Thank, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, grateful also for the presentation. We have um, covered the budgetary situation quite extensively and understandably, given the, the stark circumstances around that um, across departments can be said but uh, Chair, a, a separate issue can, can I ask I think I heard Aaron saying that some of the strategy would need to be reviewed given the feedback that had been received can we be given any indication of what areas of the strategy is are, are more likely to be reviewed and perhaps also the reasons for that on the sectors from which those requests came? Yes, uh, the the main concerns, I guess, came from the the need to have uh, maybe a greater, uh, stronger uh, wording uh, around the future vision. Um, I think, I mean, th there was a, a desire to see sort of more um, clarity around, uh, you know, what that vision uh, would mean in terms of things like, um, you know, talking about a low carbon, mm -hmm. Northern Ireland would be low carbon in 2050, um, you know, maybe stronger wording like a zero carbon in 2050, that kind of thing. So, you know, in line now with uh, some of the, the legislative uh, changes that uh, and amendments that are being proposed, you know, that, that may be something that we can, we can look at building in. Um, the, the other areas really were in and around, uh, there was a lot of, uh, positivity around the principles that were contained in there but a lot of um i suppose a, a, a sort of a, a need for momentum and a, a lot of action more action moving from the strategy to to getting more action and i'm just conscious lisa jane you, you might have uh, some more insight into some of those um responses yep certainly i think the uh it might be worth highlighting in the first instance that actually the responses to the consultation were largely positive. Um, there was very good support for the holistic green growth approach to addressing the climate change challenge here in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, good, for, good support for uh, the executive making green growth a budgetary and a policy priority as well. Uh, and finally, good support for the introduction of the statutory green growth test that Aaron mentioned, or Jude possibly mentioned in the in the opening remarks. Um, in, in terms of areas for uh, amendment within the strategy, uh, Aaron's mentioned there already just about the extent of the ambition and the clarity of the of the vision um, in the draft strategy. Um, as well as that, there was some some feedback in relation to. Um, seeking further detail on what we mean by just transition and trying to embed that uh, in, in a little bit more detail within the strategy. And then also, I suppose, just uh, highlighting the need for the strategy to take account of, I suppose, the ever-changing uh, policy and legislative uh, position uh, with the obvious uh, progress with the climate change bill to make sure that was incorporated uh, and also other major policy developments, such as the introduction of DFE's Energy Strategy Action Plan. Okay. Can, can I ask, and, and thanks for that, Lisa Jane, um, uh, J J Judith, Aaron, and yourself have given us a lot of information here, um, in, in addition to, to what was um, given to us in the presentation also, but um, can I ask if, through the ongoing consultation with the sectors, and, and it was mentioned before, there are quite a lot of, um, you know, individual areas, business areas uh, within those sectors um, and interest areas within those sectors. Can I ask if there's any recurring theme on the need for independent governance of all of this? 
because we're, we're in a situation currently with the department that's setting the strategy and making the rules um, is also governing the, the very same rules. Is that coming through in, in the consultation um, and feedback that, that's ongoing? Um, I think John, it's fair to say that we're still working our way through the entire analysis of the consultation responses. We've done some early uh, quantitative analysis, really just looking at the breakdown uh, of responses at a very high level, but we're still working our way through um, the, the qualitative analysis and saying that, that, you know, within the strategy, there is an executive commitment around um, introducing um, a robust monitoring and reporting and evaluation framework for the strategy. So we know that it is something that we will need to look at moving forward. Um, and again, within the strategy as part of that um, executive commitment, it does propose the introduction of a standing assembly committee uh, to scrutinise uh, progress in relation to the climate change uh, agenda yeah. and the green growth yeah. strategy. So it is in there. Uh, we're just working our way through the, the consultation responses, as I said. Okay, look, th th thanks both for that. that. That's useful additional information. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pass over to County Armagh now to William. Okay, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? We got you. Okay, and thank you, and thank uh, thanks for the presentation in relation to the Green Growth. Uh, in order to meet the challenges and the changes required on the Green Growth, finance money at the end of the day is going to be uh, a big factor. Uh, given that in the assembly last week, the decision to go for net zero by 2050, we're told will cost something in the region of possibly 5 billion more than the department's target of 82% by 2050. Is it not a concern as to where the money's gonna come from? For instance, the three year bid for 600 million years have only been allocated 175 million, which is less than a third of what was bid for. Would you have concerns as to the, getting the finance required to deliver on this? Green growth? Um, in, in short, what I can say is, well, I suppose if, if we if we look at uh, you know the, what the investment required going forward uh, might be, uh, you know we, we've been basing uh, you know that level of investment on what uh, the the committee for climate change advice has been. Um, and and looking at where that can come from now, I suppose the big the big challenge in all this is they certainly don't expect that that's all coming from the public sector. Uh, you know, very very definitely not. Uh, what we're trying to now set up um, is to have an investment uh, team. Um, you know, part of you know what what. Jude's currently been working on, but that's going to need to be expanded. Um, we need to be working closely with, uh, as others have said, with Invest, uh, with other departments, uh, and look at uh, how you know public sector can leverage in funding from the private sector um, to to take forward a lot of this because uh, it's not going to be you know it's not going to be able to be paid for by. Uh, the public purse. So while there are some, uh, you know, obviously concerns that you know, whenever you're trying to plan out what the the, the budget uh, uh, requirements might be and the allocations are are understandably less than than we might have hoped for, uh, going forward, we would our focus is going to be very much on trying to understand how we can get uh, those kind of partnerships uh, in place with with with, with uh, the private sector uh, to you know to attract the, the resource and investment required. You would accept that it's a massive challenge? Uh, Completely. <laughs> I would have thought so. A massive challenge. Absolutely. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, William. Okay. And, uh, okay, I'm going to head west over now to Fermanagh to Rosemary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your presentation. Um, just want to bring you back to the underspend. The underspend from the 20 million, you said it, you would have an underspend of about 10 million. And, you know, listening to climate change and the issue with animals and methane, et cetera, it's very disappointed to learn, you know, that the Livestock Genetic Improvement Programme uh, has, has not got underway and has has not fulfilled what 
fulfill some of its requirements, maybe to carry out research in relation to um, this, um, in relation to perhaps supporting changes that will be needed in the climate when our climate change becomes um, over the next few years. Um, can you get, comment and say when when they will be getting organised and getting sorted out to look at various programmes? Rosemary, if I can come in for that one, Aaron, if you don't mind. So no in particular that, uh, as just one example, the issues there were um, that project was to work with industry. Um, so it was a partnership with industry and I believe that the issue was that partnership <laughs> with industry because obviously industry have been very heavily hit by COVID. So and that <laughs> led to some of the delays in being able to set up that programme and, and agree terms of reference and scope and, and, and just get it all set up. For example, that programme has been included in next year, so that programme has been carried forward and um, because they do understand the importance of it, so it has been carried forward. Um, so there's been a and number of issues with a number of them. Yeah. Yeah, and there'll be no loss of finance or anything like that. Well, it, it's been it, the programme has been carried forward and has been part of of the bid then um, <clears throat> that was included in the the DOF um, budget allocation that, that for the consultation. Um, Okay. And we are waiting from DOF word and guidance on what the implications are for, for that draft budget. Yeah. So we're still waiting on that from DOF to be able to know what the future might look like. Yeah. Okay. Because that is a worry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, as I have no other members of any kid that want to ask questions, I want to take this opportunity to Thank you, uh, Aaron, Lisa Jane and Judith for joining us this morning and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having us. No problem. Take care. All the best now. Bye Bye. Night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, members, we're going to move on to the next item of the agenda, number six. It's a, a, a stakeholder oral evidence session on the Agricultural Support Common Framework. It's page 44 of your packs. It's a briefing uh, from the Clark on both the agri support and the chemicals and pesticides common frameworks, which we will consider on the next item. A copy of the agri support common framework is also and food is also included at page. Uh, okay, included. Sorry, sorry, sorry page fifty-two. Uh, okay, Nick, do you want uh, to comment on anything in relation to the paper? Chair, thank you. Yes, just um. By way of uh, introduction to this for members, there's a summary of the key aspects of the agri support and chemicals and pesticides common frameworks at, at page 44. Um, and I do appreciate that the full common framework documents are really quite lengthy and technical. And um, just by, to try and cut through some of that by members, um, try to highlight the key points. So the agri support common framework. Um, aims to facilitate a forum for the four jurisdictions in the UK to discuss policy in relation to agricultural spending, marketing standards, crisis measures, uh, cross-border holdings and data collection and sharing. Um, and that includes issues which may arise due to the protocol whereby NI has to retain parity with EU law in respect of marketing standards and agri-support. Um, and it commits the parties, i.e. all four jurisdictions, to joint ways of working. Um, it encompasses two, two key elements, the structures of the agri-support framework, and those are existing and developing policy matters, and also monitoring of the market and, and, and how that might, might impact industry. In terms of specific protocol issues, Northern Ireland at present has to maintain parity with EU legislation in respect of um, agri-marketing standards, state aid and agri-support mechanisms. Um, state aid requirements <coughs> apply only in respect of goods which are traded from NI to GB and agricultural support is exempt from state aid rules but only up to a maximal level which ultimately will be defined by the Joint Ministerial Committee. In terms of the structures of the Agri-Support Framework, there are two primary decision-making groups comprising policy officials from all four jurisdictions. 
One of those is the Agricultural Policy Collaboration Group, which will meet every quarter to discuss policies on agri-support, potential innovations and changes, and to consider whether any proposed changes may lead to un unwanted divergence. The other forum is the Marketing Monitoring Group, which will meet every two months and comprise uh, officials and anal analysts who will look at market dynamics, prices, production data, etc. And the Market Monitoring Group will make recommendations to the policy group um, in respect of any market forces which may impact on policy. Both of those groups will feed in to the DEFRA Senior Officials Programme Board, which will comprise senior um, policy officials from all jurisdictions who will consider issues of contention, makes, uh, make strategic decisions and seek to resolve disputes. The Senior Officials Programme Board will feed in to the EFRA Interministerial inter Group, which acts obviously as the, as the senior ministerial level for decision making and seek to resolve disputes or issues which cannot be decided at lower tiers. Um, and effectively, that's a, that's a very broad outline of the agri-support common framework and the principles and structure of the chemicals and pesticides common framework is very similar in the sense of there will be uh, mid-level official policy groups feeding into the senior programme board at DEFRA, which will subsequently report up to the ministerial representatives from each of the four administrations. Um, so that's just a brief background of the structure, Chair, of the Agri-Support Common Framework. That's great. Nick, your uh, summary and your verbal summary as well is uh, very helpful. Um, Members, we, we can move on to have the officials now. Are you, are you okay? We move on to have the officials now. And if, yeah, okay. Um, okay, members, uh, you'll also see in your packs related cars. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want, is members okay that we move on uh, and then the officials will do the briefing and they can ask questions. Then, or do you have any questions of Nick before we move on? Okay, we move on. Okay. Okay, members, you'll also see in your packs uh, correspondence from the House of Lords Common Framework Scrutiny Committee to BEIS, highlighting concerns as to how the subsidy control bill, which is currently uh, progressing uh, through Parliament, may interact with the Agri Support Common Framework and others. The bill, as proposed, allows the Secretary of State to refer subsidy schemes introduced by devolved legislators, legis legislators to the competitions, a Competition and Markets Authority. Um, I want to welcome uh, the following officials to a meeting uh, this morning. William Irvine, the Deputy President of the Ulster Farmers Union, and Ian Stevenson, uh, the Chief Executive of the Livestock uh, um, Meat, Commission, Meat Commission. We were we were to have an official from DERA with us this morning, but they are not available. So, um, William and Ian, uh, it's good seeing you again, and I would like maybe to, um, to, um, to get the opportunity if you want to maybe do it. A bit of a, a bit of a commentary on it, or any opening remarks, and uh, members who may want to ask some questions of you. Okay. Can you hear me, William? Ian? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Ian. Good seeing you again, Ian. Yes, likewise. hasn't hasn't been too long. It feels. <laughs> I was going to say it. I was, I was going to say it's it's it, I was going to say long time no see, but it's, it's not long time no see at all. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, and um, so I suppose maybe just a, a very a very brief sort of opening comment from from my side, Chairman. Um, I suppose having having read through the the, the document on on the agricultural support common framework, I suppose in, in principle certainly it sounds like a good idea in terms of you know managing the risk of divergence and and, and issues re relating to the internal market, and and also I suppose it does provide quite a a detailed sort of level of administrative sort of processes for collaboration, coordination, and and cooperation on, on agricultural support issues. But I suppose you could say, um, you know, it, it is it looks effectively like a gentleman's agreement. You know, it's non-legislative, so you have to you have to query just you know how how will the system stand up to a test? For example, if there is a if there is a, a genuine dispute arises, you know, through the various resolution processes, 
you know, so you'd have to just wonder, you know, it, you know, it, it talks in, in the framework that, you know, there can be an agreement to disagree, <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't necessarily help if it comes to a, an issue that may significantly cause issue, you know, for one uh, devolved area over another. So I suppose that's my main sort of, you know, assessment of it. Look, it's, it's non-legislative. It sounds like a good enough idea just when it's properly put to the test, how well will it work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, William, William, do you have anything yeah. on that, that sir? Yeah, well, I, I just just a few brief comments as well. Uh, good, good morning, everybody, and th thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I, I'll broadly agree with what Ian, Ian said there. You know, in principle, this is a a, a good and and sen sensible approach. To you know, when when we're within Europe, there was an overarching view on all these things that applied to everybody. But now, with the Brexit situation, there is the the, the possibility of divergence between regions, and then that, that that's good that that is monitored and uh, and assessed that it doesn't uh, doesn't have unintended consequences. Uh, and, and that that's all fine and good. Uh, there was a a chance for for interested parties to uh, sort of feed into this process. Unfortunately, due to administrative error, the union didn't get that chance. So I was sort of coming a wee bit late to this. But as I say, no big issues until we arrive at the point where a Northern Ireland is not the same as the other UK regions because of the protocol and us being under the EU regulatory zone. So a I've been sort of. I'm I'm looking at this from the supply of plant protection products to Northern Ireland, and a uh, we a uh, quite possibly naively sort of thought we we would have access to both the EU and UK a uh, markets in this and availability of products. But uh, the way it has played out, when there's a divergence of what the EU think on, on anything and the UK position, rather than being able to access both, we, we end up in a no man's land where we can access ne neither of these of the products, where, where there's a difference of opinion as to how they're used or, or, or they're, it, whether it's acceptable to use them. So, and, and that brings us a when we're in that position, what Northern Ireland requires for these products is a specific Northern Ireland license and label. And our market does not justify the expense of getting that license and label. And that that's so that there has to be some flexibility as to how Northern Ireland uh, can access products. Now, I'm, I'm referring this to plant protection products, chemicals. But it also applies to animal health medicines and a range of other issues. So, so we have concerns on that. So, uh, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, Chairman. Thank, thank you, William. And um, good seeing you last night as well as it was. Um, <laughs> great members. The um, I suppose what I want to maybe mention to you. We don't have a department official there, uh, but even just yourselves. Um, you know, you know, you know yourselves from involved in the sector that a lot of farmers um, they would have they would have holdings on both sides of the border. You know, in some cases the border might run through fields and stuff like that. There, um, and, I, and I, my understanding is the cross border that's been referred to here in the framework is cross border between the, uh, the effect of the UK regions. But you know, here in this part of the world, you know, the cross border can actually uh, cross between. The north and south, which is one part in the EU and one part out of the EU. Do you see any any issues there? A, a, a tension emerging effectively between, um, you know, the requirements of trying to pull together a common framework across the four uh, four regions, uh, but then the fact that you know we, we, we actually ha you know are, are in the same landmass as the rest of the island. Hey. I, I, I don't I don't see it. I, I, I see the issue all around. A, we're trying to live under two regulatory regimes, 
and, and that's that's what leaves us in a difficult place here. A get products that are licensed and and re, a, allowed in the Republic of Ireland a, that does not allow us to use them. Mm -hmm. We in, we need a specific Northern Ireland license. Now, mm -hmm. what what happens in those border areas and how how that's monitored and regulated? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. There's room for confusion there. So yeah. There is. Yeah. Thank you. But maybe just to add one point yeah. to that, Chairman. I, th I think certainly that that's my reading of the the framework as well in terms of your interpretation. I think it, it does specifically say that that you know it, it is purely consideration for this framework of cross border holdings. You know mm -hmm. within within the I suppose the, the the four regions of the UK and it certainly it specifically says that land situated within Ireland is not considered to be part of a cross border holding for purposes of this concordat. So. So, you know, that that was my reading of it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I suppose it, it, it boils down to, I suppose, what, what William's saying as well, just in terms of, you know, we're probably going to be more closely aligned in terms of, of our regulatory systems, et cetera, you know, with, with, with the Republic of Ireland going forward, because we're, we're obviously following EU laws on, on, in a lot of areas. So, but it's how divergence primarily, I suppose, from, from the UK mainland, I suppose, how that sort of plays out in practice, you know, under these arrangements, if there is, if there is significant divergence, you know, what, what implications does that have for us? You know, if there can't be a, a sensible agreement reached under under these, I suppose, voluntary common frameworks, as, as certainly this one appears to be. Yeah, thank you for that, Ian. Um, I'm going to uh, go around the room here. Um, jo John, John Blair. <clears throat> thanks, Chair, and thank, thanks, William and Ian, as well, for giving us your, your thoughts on this. Uh, can I ask you just a, a general question, separate to the formal consultation that took place, um, are you both in your respective organisations being included or involved in any ongoing discussions that DERA is having with UK government, EU or any of the other regions? Are you being consulted on a regularly, regular and ongoing basis? Hey, I'd come in first if that's OK, Ian. Yeah. A, as I said in the earlier consultation, we, we were missed out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ho hopefully now we will be included. A, there is, a, to a small extent, there's an element of our future being discussed in Europe and, and, and a GB without enough involvement by ourselves. And it would be, you know, hopefully we'll work that to a better place. But, but yeah. it, it's... It, 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 we have to stand up and fight our corner here. Okay, right, right. I think in the general term, John, you know, in terms of, I suppose, DERA and, and involvement in, in industry engagement, you know, certainly as, as LMC, we're not specifically involved in, in sort of like the, the workings of the, the trade advisory group, you know, or the sort of the, the trade and agriculture group, I think it was maybe William that was involved in, I suppose, looking at the whole future of agricultural support policy within Northern Ireland and, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe some of these framework discussions may be featured as part of that. So, but I know certainly UFU and other red meat industry groups, you know, the likes of the Northern Ireland meat exporters would have been involved in those discussions. So, okay. so I think that my, my understanding certainly, when you can keep it right, there has been pretty good engagement, you know, from, from the DRS side in terms of how, how policy has evolved and, and, and certainly the, the, the development, I suppose, of the, even the agricultural policy consultation that just closed this week, you know, certainly industry would have had quite a lot of, of, of considered input into that process, as, as did we. We were able to present to the, 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 the Brexit sort of transition committee within DERA as well in terms of some of our own thinking around that. So I, I would have to say the DERA engagement with industry has been has been pretty good, you know. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that's really where I'm coming from, Ian, so that, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would just support Ian on that comment. You know, the future yeah. support consultation and all that, what, what, like, what, there was a huge amount okay. of engagement there. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to move over to uh, Will, William Irwin. Now, William? We have two Williams in this. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> William. And, 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 yeah. and, and they're both on the one kind of. Um, <laughs> One would hope that any divergence would be minor in the main. And I, maybe I'm just a, an optimist. You would hope that common sense would prevail and there would be 
there should be ways around of dealing with that. Can you see? Can you see this has been a major issue? Do you believe that divergence will be more than I think it might be? Uh, I, I again, I would have thought divergence should be minor in the, in the main, but I, I could be wrong on that, of course. Well, if I can come in there, a divergence on the plant protection products and divergence in animal medicines has the potential to be huge and, and significant okay. impacts to Northern Ireland. A, it's been pushed back to the end of this year on the animal medicine front, but a, when, the, when the protocol arrangements are enforced at the end of this year on animal medicines, it, it's putting forty percent of our animal medicine at risk, and, and that that is hugely significant. And and like when you, uh, in recent meetings with vets, like anesthesia products and and products like that are at risk, and like that that doesn't bear thinking about for for the that. And and yeah. I should say this is this is bigger than an agricultural issue. Over half of the animal medicines used in, in the Northern Ireland are for pets, so uh, there's wider implications. Okay. And at this moment, we are allowed to use those medicines uh, freely available. So. Yeah, uh, the, it, 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 that, the, the new regulation should have kicked in at the start of this year, but because everybody knew it was unworkable, it's been pushed back a year, but but it's still there to be implemented. Yep. William, let's hope that some common sense prevails and these issues can be reined in and, and, and sorted out before that happens, because, I mean, you really, you know, Suppose being a farmer like yourself, you think that common sense will, will prevail, but sometimes there's not that much common sense when it comes to these issues. Common sense can be a rare item at times. Yeah, absolutely. William. Okay. Thank you. Um, both. Thank you both, Williams. Uh, Rosemary. Thank you, and good to see you, gentlemen, again after a few hours. Next um, <laughs> time last night, and um, just to say, to, say to you, I'm. It, it really concerns me, this issue of animal medicines and um, this 40% animal medicines not being available. Obviously, uh, living in the West and, our, so, and uh, representing a, a rural, rural constituency. Um, what, what are the views then? And I, I know we're mo moving slightly, maybe slightly away from it. But for example... Our, pet, our policy on, on our pets travelling with us on holiday to Scotland and, and bringing them home again. and Nothing has moved on that so far in relation to animal medicines and having them injected for rabies when there's no such thing now within the United Kingdom. That is still an issue also, I take it, William? A that's sort of outside my knowledge, Rosemary, to be honest now, just on the, the impact on, on the pet movements. A, on animal movements, there's still complications there. And it, it's yeah. very, very bureaucratic. And, and the, the significant pedigree livestock trade, you know, what yeah. the Barbie guys would have t taken a lot of high value stock to sales in Scotland and north of England. That has that has been decimated, really, a yeah. bit, bit by the, this play out. And and then William, yes, I know it's been decimated. Well, do you think this framework will help that in any way? As you say, it's not legislative, and someone has got to ask, what's the point if it's not legislative and it's not going to be of benefit? Well, well, if if I was lived in any of the uh, you know, Wales, Scotland, or England, I, I could see good benefit in it. It's, Morning, it's just because of our protocol that mm -hmm. uh, it, it's more complicated for us. But but uh, UK wide, I would view it as a, a good and sensible approach to to keep the four U UK nations broadly on the same page across all these issues. Yeah, I, I maybe just add a wee bit to that, uh, William. Just in terms of. In terms of some of the arrangements within it, particularly around you know the likes of the, the UK Agricultural Market Monitoring Group, the, 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 those types of arrangements are are very important. You know, for example, even within the UK, we as LMC do 
cattle dead weight price reporting, for example, just for the Northern Ireland region. And, and certainly having that sort of joined up sort of coordination of, of market based information across the UK and having experts there that can feed that type of knowledge into the, the policy group, you know, in terms of when they're considering issues around maybe, you know, maybe impacts on trade within the within the UK region. And, and we have seen some trade changes in the last year. You know, for example, there, there wasn't any cattle imported into Northern Ireland last year, for example, from GB mainland for direct slaughter. And that traditionally was a, a route of, you know, particularly that it would have been quite often, you know, a few thousand cows would have come in traditionally for, you know, processing in Northern Ireland and, and maybe some prime cattle as well. But, you know, that, that trade has largely switched from, you know, stock now coming from the Republic of Ireland, I suppose, to, to fill that gap. So, so you can see some market changes, you know, um, although some of those are probably more maybe protocol related, but in terms of in terms of being able to sort of have that general sort of coordination and discussion and open engagement, I think at official and ministerial level, it is important. You know, the, the principles around this framework are sound as far as I can see. It's just when you get a when it gets into the, the, the issues of dispute around certain issues, yeah. you know, how effective will it be without a legislative basis? That's you know that that's my main sort of issue regarding it you know just will it have any teeth really yeah yeah and that's that's what i'm asking how useful is it when it comes to disputes you're quite right there so in other in other words william you see really as your main, main policy challenge over the next year really is the animal medicines issue uh, animal animal medicines plant plant protection products a, a and and actually a the, the, there was a strong historic trade, a, a huge amount of the seed potato uh, that's used in Northern Ireland would have been sourced in Scotland, and a huge amount of the of the cereal seed uh, was sourced from from uh, UK or GB as a whole, and and those movements have got seriously complicated. Yeah. Our, our our merchants are being told they have the option of two varieties for spring barley. Yeah, and like that, that curtails our our growers' options significantly, and uh, basically, it's it's by by in bulk and sort of almost by the lorry load, or you know, you can't fine tune if it, for for whatever reason you needed a, a five acre field with a specific variety, and it, 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 that's going to be almost impossible to get that yeah. specific variety. Okay, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, and as Rosemary, I think, is the last person to uh, ask a question, I want to thank you. Um, um, I want to thank you all for, thank you for coming here this morning, taking your time out, um, William and Ian, and say it's good to see you again, and hopefully we'll be seeing you more of you in the future. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Take care, folks. Take care. Bye. Okay, members, we're going to move on to item number seven now. It's the Stakeholder O11 session on the Chemicals and Pesticides Common Framework. Uh, a copy of the Chemical and Pesticides Common Framework uh, is at page 127 of your packs. Uh, and uh, just by way of reminder, a briefing memo by the clerk is at page 44. And we have a number of officials who are joining us here this morning. Um, I know we're running actually a wee bit ahead of time. We're not doing too bad. Okay, we have, um, okay, we've got uh, Duncan Gallagher of uh, NA Water here, and we have got Bruce Dale, the chairperson of the uh, Ultimate Arable Society, and we have William, who is staying on with us for the for this next part. So I want to want to thank you very this morning. Uh, this morning, um, I'd like to perhaps ask ask uh, uh, Dumpna, uh to make some open remarks and reviews on the common framework as proposed. Any issues you foresee? In respect to uh, policy divergence in this area, and then we'll get input as well from uh, Bruce and William. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. So good my name is Dick McGallagher. I'm head of drinking water regulation for Northern Ireland Water, uh, and as such, I'm interested in protection of public health through good, safe, clean drinking water. As you would imagine, a very public health-driven remit for me. So. Uh, yeah, it's great actually to be part of this discussion. So very much appreciate that uh, Agriculture and Environment and Rural Affairs have, have invited us both to do the consultation on this and a number of other uh, pieces of policy and inclusion in this discussion today. Very happy to be doing that. So 
we provide, as you know, uh, McLean said, drinking water to schools, hospitals, communities, businesses, and, and other critical national infrastructure across Northern Ireland. Uh, and importantly, all of our children and our grandchildren drink uh, the water and businesses use the water to produce food and all of that sort of thing as well. We have in NI Water a source to tap approach, which means that uh, we engage in investment to, to improve our raw water. So the fields and the, uh, the land that the drinking water, raw water runs over before it gets to the river or the reservoir before it's treated. That's all part of what we think about in terms of protection of drinking water supplies. And we do that through a catchment management approach. So really working with land managers. There's a number of uh, problems within our catchments, naturally enough, and those very often are pesticides and chemicals or uh, plant protection products, as they're referred to, I think, in your world more often. So particularly um, ammonia, organics, colour, uh, MCPA and glyphosate, they'll all be things that you will, will know about. They all contribute to water, raw water supplies in a greater or lesser extent. So reduction or removal of those substances, whilst understanding their necessary uses in this period of history and agricultural history, particularly in Northern Ireland, is a key objective for us. So we want to do it, but we want to do it uh, well and thinking about everybody else's agendas as well. In doing that, then we'll be able to provide water without pesticides and herbicides. Um, we will be able to reduce treatment costs. And just at this very point in time, there's a treatment works being built at uh, Derg um, in Straban at a cost of 4 million specifically for MCPA removal. So that's the specific element of that uh, investment. And that's a public push and that, that, that's passed on to the farming community that those costs as well and drinking water costs. So, so we want to do, we want to protect our catchments in a way which allows us to have a good, clean, safe drinking water in a social tap approach. And therefore, anything that can be done and any um, interaction that we can have with you guys in terms of protection raw water sources is really, really important to us. That's, that's all I had to say in the meantime, but I'm happy to take questions. And, and Rebecca Allen is here with me as well, one of our catchment officers, Chair, who is also happy to take questions from the group. That's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Daphna, um, tell me this. Um, how um how does DERA currently how does DERA currently engage with use uh, in respect of the chemicals and pesticides framework? Like you know what what you know how 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 do they do that? How regularly would that be? So there's there's not an awful lot of engagement, and it's certainly not a regular thing. But Becca, you will have more of the detail on that if you want to come in. Yeah, certainly. Um... We we would actually engage with Dira uh, not 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 very regularly, but we do sit with Dira on a number of uh, groups, including the Water Catchment Partnership, uh, along with Bruce here as well, um, who's also a member. And in that in that team, um, Dira, um, the number of different Dira departments, including environmental farming, uh, the pesticides and seeds uh, department, if I get that name right, um, and um, NIEA sit on those meetings as well. So in that in that group, we discuss uh, specifically pesticides and plant protection products, and really how we can drive them down through uh, voluntary um, promotion of best practice and and that sort of thing uh, for far for farmers and other users. Uh, we also have a, a high level liaison with DERA um, at, a, at a sort of higher level than that on a biannual basis. Uh, to discuss sort of you know any policy changes upcoming uh, or anything that we can feed into like like consultations and the like, um, and then at a lower level than that we we would be you know myself for example would be in con contact with NIEA catchment officers uh, after pollution events or after um, elevated ammonia in rivers or elevated ammonia coming into our treatment works pesticides um, worries anywhere that we see coming into uh, in our water courses. So we do have um, at various different levels quite a bit of uh, work, work with DERA. We don't have obviously direct input into their policy writing, but we, they, they, they definitely, um, they, they work, we work well together. Uh, and, and tell me this, like, have you had any or, or much get with the UK Chemicals Governance, Governance Board? 
we don't have direct uh, feed into that, uh, Declan, but we do, um, we, th through our liaison and our cons cons uh, consultations with DERA, the likes of David Gillespie and his team, we would f be able to feed into those, you know. Mm -hmm. um, DERA are very conscious to ask us, they know, you know, even unofficially, they would ask us if we have anything to add. Mm -hmm. And you and see in relation to you mentioned ammonia there, have have you have you not or have you had any input into the department's um ammonia action plan that will be that has been drafted or will hopefully be launched soon? Yes, I think we fed into the, the pre consultation and the consultation phases of that, um or we were invited along with many others of the stakeholders, yeah. So we had mm -hmm. a great opportunity. Yeah, and is there any, and tell me, is there any particular parts of the common framework that you would like say be concerned about in any way? Or um, I haven't read it. I think we're. I mean, we're we're pretty happy that uh, pretty content that the protection that we've been afforded, you know, uh, prior to Brexit and during the transition period is going to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having read through, it it seems like it's going to continue on the same vein. Um, whilst also recognising what William said earlier, uh, William Irvine, UFU said earlier about the difficulties with different pesticides and things coming in, uh, yeah. and the farmers getting availability of those. So we do the framework will afford us the, the same environmental and water quality protection, but we also recognise that um, the difficulties with 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 the PPP market in particular um, it could lead to maybe emerging emerging pesticides that we haven't maybe seen before. If farmers don't have the opportunity to use what they're usually used, there could be alternatives being brought in, which maybe could mm -hmm. cause us some small risk, but we're, we're, um, we're prepared for that anyway. Um, uh, Can I come in on that one as well? Right, yes. fine. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I think it's important just to recognize uh, that we can treat to, to a certain extent the pesticides that we know about and herbicides that we know about our biggest fear would be something uh, happening which happens underground, uh, which doesn't, because of the political situation, because of the, the new recast directive, because of the new regulations the, and the, the protocol, etc., that we might face a problem that is an unknown. Now, we do monitor drinking water supplies for lots and lots of un unknowns, so it should turn up at some stage, but it certainly gives a big problem to protection of public health and the public purse if that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, um, I'm going to, um, okay, pa Patrick, you want to ask a question there? Yeah, just thanks very much, Chair, and thank you all for your contribution. I'm just thinking in terms of the NI water and uh, the um, the water treatment plants that, that you would have. Um, surely it, it makes common sense to have commonality of standards because, let's face facts, the water, particularly I'm thinking of areas like Derry or Stravan, places like that, the source of the water that's coming to you needs to have common uh, standards and, and common levels of um, oversight to make sure that the quality of emission, the stuff, the end product that you provide to to uh, consumers, all of us, has to be of a good enough standard and there aren't any slippages and standards that would be expected. Yes, absolutely agree. And that's part of the reason, I think, why the recast of the Drinking Water Quality Directive is being considered uh, to be implemented in Northern Ireland regardless of what happens. And I know that's a political discussion that I'm not <laughs> at all good at, but um, it's all about that consistent supply of drinking water to a level where they comply with the regulations and they comply with regulations for food, you know, that is uh, produced, consumed, whatever, in Northern Ireland or uh, outside Northern Ireland. So it's important for that consistent piece. But <coughs> I suppose even more importantly than the political dimension, uh, when you think about it from a public uh, perception piece and look at uh, your regulations are there to protect the public and public health, that's not something that we would see as uh, being different no matter where the water goes to, across Northern Ireland or outside Northern Ireland. It should be the same uh, high quality pr uh, pr product. Okay, thank you. Problem. Um, I'm going to move over to Bruce and William. Do you want to make uh, any comments here, Bruce and William? Uh, good morning again, Mr. Chair and the members. Uh, this is uh, third Thursday in a row. It's getting about making a habit of it. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for having me again. You're putting up with me well. Thank you. 
You could use, you could, you could, you could get used to wearing those earphones, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking them out to farm with me now, actually, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, I, I sat down on your meeting, took a liberty of coming in about 10 past 11 there. And to be fair, some of the stuff that would be in my mind today, William has, has to some extent covered. Um, I suppose my bigger problem, having sat down on your fertilizer framework one last week, and this one again today, I suppose I just maybe in my own mind struggle a bit as to see how we relate this to operating on the ground on farm. You know, this is uh, obviously more to do with governance is really what I'm taking out of all this. But I suppose where I struggle then within that is, say, for example, there in paragraph seven of the, of the document there, geographic scope. At 7.4, it says, as England, Wales and Scotland begin to operate and develop their own regimes, it is recognised that the requirements of the protocol on Ireland stroke Northern Ireland, henceforth referred to as the Northern Ireland Protocol, could result in divergence between Northern Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales. And I, as William, William has pointed out very clearly this morning, we already have issues of divergence. And I just wonder what power or what scope of responsibility, it says back in paragraph 3.2, you know, about, about policy responsibility. If we are having to work under an EU-guided system here, what input will this framework coming across the United Kingdom, if you like, have here actually in reality? You know, I suppose that's, that's where I struggle with it a bit. You know, I'm just trying to get a handle on that for myself and to see how we can apply that on the ground because I'm a practical person. I work at farm level every day and... Um, advise and help as an agronomist you know, as regards chemical choices and chemical usage. Uh, Dimpton and Rebecca have mentioned here about integrated pest management. I encourage that every day uh, to reduce the amount of pesticides and, and chemicals and plant protection products that we're using. But I just, I'm struggling to see, just to get a handle on this. So forgive me if, if, if I'm wrong there. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me, Bruce, have, would you have had much engagement with DERA on the chemicals and pesticides policy? Um, I think for me personally, the answer to that, Mr. Chair, would be no, certainly very, very little. Um, mm -hmm. We would really have to go seeking information ourselves. And what tends to happen is we hit a wall and then we sort of have to go to the air to find out what are we going to do mm -hmm. about this, you know. Um, and we have this particular problem beginning to develop now with the guard, as William has mentioned, about availability and labelling of products because we are sitting here, as is mentioned in the document, you know, we're, man we're sitting here almost in a sort of a no man's land as regards who takes responsibility for licensing and registering the products that are now going to be used in Northern Ireland. We have a, an ongoing situation with this thing called the CRD, the Chemical Regulation Division of the Health and Safety Executive. They run the day-to-day the -day stuff for, for um, uh, regulation and, and registration of products, but they are not taking responsibility for products that need re-registration now to come into Northern Ireland, and um, I just don't know who is going to do it, you know, and where we're, where we're going to stand on this thing, because the Republic's um, system known as PCS, technically and legally, does has, has no say here whatsoever. We, can, we cannot go by their uh, availability situation of products either, so... I just see this as a very difficult one currently. You know, this is, this is a situation that needs resolved, whether it's within the framework or whether it's even at a, a more political level, if you know what I'm trying to say, you know. Thank you, that, Bruce. Rosemary? Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for that. Bruce, I was interested to hear what you said. So, in in other words, your your problem is between the government, between the policy that's in these frameworks, which seems to be, which is all very good to look at and read, and actually the practicalities of uh, putting it into practice and working. For example, as you say, getting these pesticides over. So there is a there is a gap there, an uneasy gap there that someone needs to take and look at and try and work with the person with with the practicing uh, the person that's using these uh, pesticides etc cetera, etc cetera. am i right oh you're exactly right rosemary yes you've you've sussed that one as well um 
Yeah, it is a real problem, this. Um, and actually, we're also concerned too, when you mentioned <clears> there about movement of seed and smaller, you know, tying things down. We're finding now actually that even the major manufacturers, worldwide manufacturers, I'm talking about, you know, Bayer Crop Science based in Germany, BASF, all these big international worldwide companies, they're actually now really starting to cut down on the range of products that they're offering into Northern Ireland, you know, and uh, and this is maybe not the stuff maybe so much directly related even to Northern Ireland water situation with, you know, particularly herbicides being applied to catchment areas. I'm talking more about arable areas where, you know, cereal fungicides and stuff that are required here for crop health and for crop yield uh, um, are, are really becoming more limited and uh, the companies are just saying you want a separate specific label and recommendation here for Northern Ireland. We are here, I think I've maybe quoted this to you folk before, Northern Ireland only represents 1.3% of the total plant protection product use across the whole of the UK, only 1.3%. So we are very, very small, yet to us a very, very important local market, of course. But the companies are just saying you're not worth the hassle. Yeah, you're not financially, it's not financially viable for them to produce extra labels or separate labeling, etc. For, for Northern Ireland. And sadly, Bruce, it's the same with many food products, etc. also that perhaps need separate labeling. So I under, understand where, you, where you're coming from. Just can I, can I ask you just one other question, Bruce, through the chair, if that's okay? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's just... Um, so you can't even buy your products. You can't buy your products in the Republic of Ireland either and use them, can you, in Northern Ireland then if if you needed those pesticides? The only product we are allowed to use legally in Northern Ireland, there are two There are two separate schemes, just very briefly, yeah. if I can explain this, Mr. Chair. Uh, there you have what you call the MAPP, the MAP scheme, which is the UK system of product yeah. registration and regulation. In the Republic, based in Dublin, they have a setup called the PCS, okay? And that is a specific uh, scheme that only applies to product used in the Republic. So um, if, say, a farmer here, William, for example, there uses a PCS-only registered product, pops down to Dundalk or whatever and buys it, brings it up the road and puts it on his Sally's land or his barley, yeah. whatever it is, and that's, de that's declared on his uh, uh, field records, at the end of the year for his quality assurance schemes, he will probably be docked from the quality assurance scheme. And he would probably also be taken, it would taken further and he'd probably have a, a penalty imposed as regards to his single farm payment. Uh, yeah. The only product he could bring up north, uh, if you like, is one that has both. And there are one or two companies that have done this with just one or two products, because I've had them in my own store, I've handled them, where they have both a PCS and an MAPP number. One or two companies do do that. Can I just also say, Rosemary, just that a number of us met a delegation from of EU officials on Tuesday week, and I raised this situation with them, and they were totally unaware of this. They were of the opinion that we could legally and objectively go to the Republic, buy our product, bring it up here and use it. And I said, absolutely yeah. not. And they were surprised and shocked by that. So... Who is saying you can't do it? Um, what I'm, I'm, I'm not being contra controversial here, but I'm just asking who is saying it is? Who's saying you can't do that? Or are you? Uh, it's obviously within Northern Ireland that issue is with with Dira. Then yes, it is. Yes, and actually, I have a yes, it is with Dira. Mm -hmm. And actually, I have a publication here, the Farm Advisory System newsletter, which actually outlines it here: regulatory pesticides in Northern Ireland post EU exit. Is actually the yeah. document here. It's produced by Helen Thompson and Bruno Mallon. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's clarifying the point that we cannot use PCS only label products here. Right. No, that's that was what I wanted to get explained because I, I get it in my head to understand it properly. That that was very useful. Thank you, Bruce. You're very welcome. Okay. No problem. Okay. Uh, William. Thank yes, you, Mr. Chairman, and thank Bruce and again William and the rest for giving us the presentation. Um, would you say that as a thing stands, it is currently unworkable because it looks to me as it stands, it is unworkable in relation to the protocol situation and these, and as, as things stand at the moment, it is unworkable. Uh, if you wish me to answer, William, I think the answer is a definite yes. 
And yeah. it, it also, it, to be fair, it maybe depends too on the particular market. As I said the earlier, we're only 1.3% of the whole UK market here. But even within that, you have very small, very specialised, for example, uh, say the potato sector, which is still relatively small, acreage wise, and, and even smaller still is the horticulture and field vegetable side. You know, some of those growers maybe only require one to two litres in a whole year of some particular product that they require to apply, maybe to the cabbages or their leeks or whatever it may be. You know, they only use very, very small quantities of it. It's becoming totally impossible to source those products now because no one is prepared to even put small quantities. Like the whole of Northern Ireland may only use two or three outer cases, you know, 24, 36 litres of a product like that in an entire calendar year. And no one is prepared to market that stuff into Northern Ireland now. And yet it's vital to the crop that those guys are trying to produce for us. Okay, thank you. No, it looks that way to me too, that this is totally unworkable. So let's hope that a way can be found around it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bruce and William, that was, uh, that, that was uh, your comment very happy. William, did you want to go in there? The other William? But, yes, if I, if I could just make a few comments. Yep. Uh, pick up on, on Bruce's uh, uh, last point there. Uh, we, we had a conversation about 12 months ago with the uh, dear officials and, and the CRD guys about a product that was being but uh, uh, had become unavailable. And the comment was, sure, it, 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 it's only a tiny amount used, what odds? But, but actually, if, if you have a specific vegetable crop, it's crucial to the, the health of that crop to, to have the availability of, of the specific product for that case. And, and th there's a general key point here, you know, Northern Ireland's uh, under EU regulation around this, but actually our main market is still GB. And, and the, that, that's why these divergences cause such a headache for our, our growers. You know, it, 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 we're in a pinch point there. And a uh, central to this and the availability of products is this this entity known as CRD, which operates within the health and safety big executive in, in UK. And uh, what we are being told is that it is under pressure and underfunded. And actually, given our current position and the challenges we are facing, we, we would need a, Almost a dedicated section within that CRD mm -hmm. to to help facilitate our way through all these issues, and mm -hmm. you, you know, hey, if the current problems were sorted tomorrow, that is not the job done because month by month there will be other divergences, and every every time that happens, we're back into mm -hmm. the same position again. Mm -hmm. so, William, do you know? Uh, do you know uh, William or Bruce? Has um have these issues been raised at by DERA at any of the joint committee level, EU UK level? Do you know has any of this, these issues been raised? We we have been raising these issues uh, pretty much uh, uh, for a year now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a round a DEFRA round table meeting that happened uh, weekly there for a while now. It's it's slacked off a bit now, specifically to. For, uh, as a, a method of us laying out our, our proto protocol issues on rain plant protection, seed availability, mm -hmm. and all the other issues. And and we have been feeding those in. Bruce has been involved. Uh, the veterinary side have been involved. Uh, seed merchants have been involved. And and then when we go to that meeting that Bruce referred to with EU officials, and they were not aware of our problems and our fixing this. Mm -hmm. So there's a frustration there that while we have been continually a making our case here, it does not seem to get to the a high level political mm -hmm. ears that that need to uh, get their head around this. You know, and maybe as something, and, and if the committee was in agreement, we could maybe add our weight behind in terms of um, what you the lobbying you've been doing, William. Yeah, Mr. Well, Chair, uh, could, yeah, I'm sorry, go on ahead, Bruce. Could I, Mr. Chair, could I just say yes, thank you for that. Uh, I really mm -hmm. appreciate that comment. I think that's quite vital. You see, an, another thing too, we're talking here about the shipment of products. Northern Ireland is a relatively small place, 1.8 million, but yet we produce enough food for 10 million. Yeah. So the majority mm -hmm. of our food is export. The problem we have, and it is, it is referred to here in the framework document, relates to MRLs, which are maximum residue levels 
of any particular chemical or substance within a food stuff. Um, if there happened to be divergence whereby EU rules um, uh, allowed a certain MRL for a particular product within, within, say, a particular vegetable or whatever, but England decided to reduce its MRL tolerance of any particular product, um, you could well find that the crop and grown here could not be marketed in England mm -hmm. because it would, it's, going to, it's not going to meet their, their criteria anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is a further divergence going the other way, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Whereby what we are allowed to do here actually has, has, has a negative effect on us when you try to get stuff into, on the mainland Britain, you know? So, um, so it's just a, it's, it's a very complicated picture, really. it really is. Well, man, we listen um, again. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we're hearing what you're saying is a very serious situation. Um, I think common sense should prevail here, and you know, um, I, I would be confident. I haven't put it to the committee, but I'd be confident that the the committee would would weigh in behind whatever lobbying efforts you're making with DEFRA or wherever the pressure point has to be made. Okay, we welcome that, Chairman. Okay, um, so um. Okay, members, members, okay with that? Everybody okay? Um, so, okay, I'll take the opportunity to thank you for coming along. This, this, we're, in the, we're nearly in the afternoon. We're still in the morning, so, our, so thank you very much for taking your time out to join us. Um, and, Rebecca, I, I don't think I mentioned you at the outset, so uh, I wel I'll, I'll welcome you and thank you now as we're, as we're closing shop. So thank you very much, thank folks, you. and we'll see you all again, okay? Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care now. Bye-bye. Okay, okay, um, members, we're moving on now to item number. Where are we here now? Yeah, yeah. Item number eight. Yeah, yeah. Item number eight. Um, okay. Uh, it's a written briefing. It's uh, statutory instrument, market surveillance, and a consequences amendments, etc. Regulations 2022. It's page 124 of your packs. A written briefing by the department on draft affirmative regulations that be laid by BEIS on or before the 22nd of February, which makes some amendments to regulations passed last year in respect of enforcement and non-compliance report, reporting relating to detergents, fertilizers, persistent organic uh, pollutants, mercury, release provisions, fluorinated gas, greenhouse gases, and those owned depleting substances. The committee has been notified of these regulations for information and has been invited to forward any comments to the department as soon as possible. Um, so if members are okay, you know, we can write to the department to note impending introduction of regulation and if there's anything you want to raise you can send on to link by the close of play that right yeah can i just raise raise one sure. thing chair yes, in, relation, in relation to that that's again it's introducing part of the northern ireland protocol and i don't wish to be associated with um mm -hmm. with supporting it yeah, that, that can be noted, Rosemary. Thank you very much. for. And the, could, could I add the, the same as Rosemary on that issue? I will not support it either. Okay. Right. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, that'll be noted. Okay, so, members. Uh, and, Chair, that would also apply, I suppose, um, William probably speaking on behalf of the party, but that will also <laughs> apply right across um, uh, yeah. on, on my situation as well. And for Harry too, probably. Would that be right? Yeah. You're, you're yeah. delegate for Harry this morning, aren't you? Yeah, that's Can correct. Can be noted, William? Or Nick? <laughs> uh, chair, chair, yes, I would advise probably just for the purposes of the record, we'll note that in the minutes of proceedings. Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah. Okay. Rosemary. Thank you. Okay, members, um, the uh, written briefing, uh, SL1 Marine License Exemplary Activities Amendment Order NA 2022. You recall that last year we considered the outcomes of a consultation to amend the exempted activities requiring a marine license within the inshore region of local seas. The page 180 year pack is a written briefing by the department on the regulations to bring into effect the proposed changes to update the 2011 order and ensure a consistent approach to marine licensing between local waters and wider UK. Can I suggest that we write to the department outlining that we are content in principle for proposals to proceed subject to clarification regarding how inshore exempted activities will differ from those in Ireland following amendments. Will the inshore local exemptions uh, align early with the offshore regulations as directed by the UK government? 
And will the amendments need to be raised and highlighted under the auspices of a common framework? So, members of okay, we take our course of action. Okay. Okay, members. Um, item number ten on the agenda is a um, written briefing: the direct payment to farmers review of decisions regulations twenty twenty one. It's in the table pack. It's copy. There is a, in the table pack. There's a copy of the ESR's latest report. The ESR has no comments to make in respect of this proposed regulation. So I therefore put the question: the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs considered SR twenty twenty one three forty six. The direct payments to farmers review of decisions regulations NA twenty twenty one. There's no objections to the rule. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, members. M number eleven of written briefing. It's a, a another SA the uh, agriculture and horticulture development amendment order twenty twenty two. And members, that's at page two hundred and fifty four year pack. There's a written briefing in respect of the statute instrument, which is subject to the draft. Affirmative procedure and DEFRA intends to lay it on the 29th of March. It will amend 2008 legislation on the functioning of the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board, which has a UK wide remit to coordinate approaches to market access, RD, technical advice, and knowledge exchange for defined agriculture and horticultural sectors. Activities are funded through a levy on spe specified industries. At present, it, oh, it, oh, it has a remit only in relation to cereals and oil seed sectors here. Uh, the changes will remove the existing statutory levy levies in Britain, but enable the board to make a charge against all industries defined in the 2008 Act for the services it provides to them. It will also compel the board to carry out a ballot every five years on how the money is spent. The department outlines that the impact locally of these provisions will be limited in respect to the cereals and oil seed sectors participating in the votes and that additional charges will not apply locally at this time. And the uh, committee's views and consent have been sought for this SA. And I want to suggest that members, that before we take a view on this proposal, that we seek clarity and assurance from the department on the proposed revisions in respect of how other agricultural industries may be affected in the future. Members be okay, we just get, get that clarity. Okay. Okay, members. Um, the um, written briefing uh, is a common agriculture policy cross compliance exemptions and transitional regulation amendment EU exit regulation 2022. It's a page 20, 259 in your pack. Papers pertaining to these regulations, which primarily seek to omit, uh, omit obsolete terms and provisions in England and here in respect of transposed EU law relating to. CAP. Ministers indicate there is plans to support DEFRA's proposed provisions. However, members should take note that the regulations will have an impact on horticultural producers which currently receive support, support via the Fruit and Vegetable Aid Scheme by limiting the extension of existing programmes to the end of this year and restricting the duration of any new scheme approved after December 2020 to a maximum of three years. The Department has outlined that it has not yet engaged with local stakeholders in this. Can I suggest that before, uh, can I su therefore suggest that we hold off on approving this SA until DERA confirms that it has engaged with relevant beneficiaries of the FVAS and confirmed uh, alternative provisional support? Okay. okay. I think, yeah. okay. okay, members, um, item 13 is the written briefing, the Ivory Prohibition Civil Sanctions Regulation 2022. Page 267 in your pack is a written briefing in respect uh, of these regulations, which will enable DERA to investigate any local breaches in terms of licensing trade of ivory products on behalf of the animal plant and health agency. Members uh, content to note that uh, policy proposals. Okay. Would you remember just turning to uh, cor correspondence? Um, um, there's there's some correspondence and there's a few no notable ones at page 319 of your pack you'll see correspondence from the treasury in response to the concerns we raised about the impending red diesel changes which will come into effect in april 2022 the letter sets out the rationale of the changes and the consultations that have been carried out in this regard unfortunately the treasury has declined our invitation for officials to brief the committee on this matter and advises us continuing to liaise with the local executive on this issue um, Patsy. Yeah, Chair, uh, thank you for that. Um, there, there's just one observation I would say in this. We all know 
and we're getting lobbied around this, but there's one observation on this, and it seems to dismiss the impact, particularly on the construction sector. I read the letter last night and read it there again, and there seems to be a complete disconnect there with what's going on in the, agri in the um, construction sector. Um, so I'm not, I think really we should go back to them, and maybe with a wee bit of advice from the likes of the CEF, because materials are going up, the, the impact of the increase in diesel and the, any move from red diesel to, to the white diesel, we hear the prices every morning are going up. Um, mm. And that has a knock-on effect on the cost of housing. And it would, you would think that there might be somebody in the Tory government that would have a slightly con cursory concern about affordable housing. Maybe not. But it's having as consequential and the supply of materials to... to uh, to building sites, and we know in the food chain and everything else. So, um, th this is, um, I don't know, is, is there any way we can um, just get a further briefing from the CEF, the Construction Employers Federation, around this, and in, inform uh, some of these, some, this, this lady, I think this lady in it, I, Helen Whitley, uh, inform her of the impact of just, or the import of what she's stating there. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, a, I think I think that's a that's a good uh, suggestion, Patsy. Um, should that there, and I think it's regrettable that they, that just this more or less they reiterated the rules and no one has to change them. And you know, I think you know whilst they're citing environmental reasons for it, you know, the truth is this is a an extra t tax take, <laughs> tax take, and it'll be passed on. You know, in many instances, till young people trying to build houses and, and things like that, there and a severe disruption for for the farmers as well. You know, so um, it's 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 not a uh, this is a, it's a very very serious issue. So it is, uh, okay. William. Would you look? Yeah, at thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, in my constituency, we have a number of quarry owners that live near the border. They're going to be disadvantaged big time, because of course, in the Republic, they're they're able to use their great green diesel. So I mean. It's going to have a big impact on them because they're going to have to one quarry, two different quarry owners. I think it meant about thirty-five thousand a month to them. The difference, mm -hmm. so they're going to have to pass that on, of course, which makes their product more expensive. And they're across the border, two or three mile away. Someone can undercut them. Then it's it's, it's, it's certainly having it's going to have a big impact. There's no doubt. Yeah. It places us a serious disadvantage, Philip. Absolutely. Philip. Philip, you're mute there, eh? Yep, yeah, Terry, sorry, struggling to get off uh, mute there. Yep. I mean, I, I raised this issue at the Finance Committee, which is set on too. Uh, I mean, I, I think the response that we've got uh, f from the MP is uh, absolutely ridiculous and totally unsatisfactory. So I would suggest that, that we write again. I mean, I, I've spoken to a number of uh, local contract and businesses and they're telling me this is going to have a like a six figure at least impact on their businesses which you know is going to impact on uh, people's jobs and ultimately as all of these things do will impact on the consumer uh, and and people at the, you know at the end of as you mentioned young people building houses so i mean i totally disagree with their point about the the purpose of this policy i mean it's not going to cut back on emissions and, and they haven't done anything uh, in terms of putting necessary measures or mitigating measures in place. I mean, we, we're engaged extensively discussing climate bill and climate legislation. We've talked at length about a just transition. But I mean, here's an example of where we need to see just transition practices put in place for, from the British uh, Treasury perspective, and, it's, and it has totally ignored that uh, and won't have any impact on climate. All it will do, as somebody else has said, is, is raise additional tax for the Treasury at the cost of people living here. Um, Rosemary? Thank you. Thank you. And again, I just want to reiterate what everybody else has said, or to agree with what everybody else has said. Yeah, I've been contact, contacted by several contractors, and they're talking about huge sums of money that they will be out financially. And of course, when it comes down to Hardy versus Hardy, it'll be either somebody's job on the line, and then it'll also be passed on the extra in, extra increases, extra money they're going to have to pay. Who's going to be hitting the pocket but the consumer eventually, whether that, whether that is somebody in the construction industry or somebody in the uh, land, land contracting industry or what, 
uh, whatever. It's going to hit both the farmers mm -hmm. and, as you say, the young people building houses, etc. Yeah, yeah, and also like farmers, you know, and anybody from from rural areas know that farmers might engage in non-farming activities. You know, maybe working on a building site or transporting a bit of soil or gravel or something like that there with the machinery. You know, that's going to have a big impact on them and for track charity tractor runs and everything. So it's just it's, it's totally ill ill thought out and. Um, you know, I think we, we we can't give up on it, and I think we also perhaps took up Patsy's suggestion as well, and we should also maybe write to the Department of Finance here for you know clarity and what communications that they've had in respect of the concerns, you know, and, and their conversations with the Treasury as well. What do you yeah. think? Mm -hmm. We need to take every avenue that's open to us to yeah push this one. I think yeah yeah there we're going. Okay, members, um, I'm going to move on to the, the next piece of correspondence there as the department has provided a resp uh, response in respect of how grassroots communities, as page 333, how grassroots communities um, can get engaged with the uh, under the new rural development policy. The department explains this to be facilitated by the subcommittees of the Rural Stakeholder Oversight Committee to ensure that local voices will continue to be key in the design, development and delivery of future schemes. So the subcommittees will be formed to consider innovation, entrepreneurship and employment, sustainable tourism, health and well-being, connectivity, equality and diversity and climate change. So that, that was some of the queries we raised previously about how the leader approach will be incorporated into the new programme. Um, okay, members, um, are, like if you have any more, if you have any queries in relation to that there, you know, uh, if you have any further thinking on, maybe you could raise it, raise it with Nick. Um, uh, if, you, if you want to read over that again. Um, members, the Minister has advised that an extension has been agreed across jurisdiction to extend the deadline for scrutiny on the JFS to the uh, 12th of April. Given that the Assembly will have dissolved this date by this date, it is suggested that the committee should return its comments by the 25th of March. Members content that we reply acknowledging the extension and that we intend to facilitate the return of comments accordingly. Okay. okay. Members, page 323 of PACS, you will see a reply from the Minister for the Economy regarding our queries for the monitoring of labour shortages across sectors and measures being put in place to address this. The Minister advises that data on workforce shortages is not captured locally, but the local economy is seeing similar issues uh, that reported in the UK with, with accommodation and food having around 28 having around 28% and construction around 20% uh, respectively. The Minister notes that the UK immigration processes pose particular challenges and the Department of the Economy and DERA will continue to press the UK Government to address these concerns and attempt to alleviate workforce pressures. The range of measures supported by DOE to support local people to take up employment are outlined. Um, members, uh, okay, note this, or if anyone want to add to it or anything else? Okay. Okay. Page 40 of the pack is a copy of the draft investment strategy. Um, you know, and the committee is requested to comment on this uh, proposed strategy by the 3rd of March. So if you want to get a, a chance to have a read over it, and you can bring in uh, comments maybe next week or whenever we suit, okay, before the 3rd of March. Um, folks, can suggest, um, anyone has any suggestions how you wish to make, uh, how suggest they wish to make the forum to Nick by perhaps Maybe Nick tomorrow, maybe. Otherwise, we'll write to the TEO to say that we're content with the draft strategy. So, sorry, maybe tomorrow if we get uh, comments on Nick by tomorrow. Okay. So, members, okay, we act on the correspondence, the remainder of the correspondence suggested on the index sheet. Okay. Okay, members, um, can I please seek your views on scheduling a committee meeting on an alternative day uh, week on the week commencing the 14th of March? Given that a normal meeting falls on St. Patrick's Day, can I suggest the uh, 16th of March? What members think of that? Do you write to that, would you? Yeah. Okay. All right. It just depends on the time. I'm the Finance Committee, so I presume that's uh, Wednesday. Uh, so I, I would have a Finance Committee on the Wednesday afternoon. Okay. What do our members think, or what do you reckon? Or? Make a choice. <clears throat> Go ahead, William. Uh, no, I can make it suit. Uh, uh, Wednesday morning's not too bad for me. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, li likewise, Chair, um, if it's morning, yeah. Yeah, Wednesday morning's okay for me. Right. Thank you, folks, for that there. And 
I want to refer members then to draft work for work program 342 and seek your agreement on. Okay. Members, you don't have our business. Chair, I, I have one. Um yeah. be keen to share uh with the committee and, and to hear thoughts on it and, and if we can or should do anything. Um <clears throat> Sure, I've been contacted by people, I'm sure other members have as well, uh, who are involved in their business in the food supply chain. Um, I've taken some of this up in assembly questions, so I'll explain that in a second. But the, the basic problem is um, businesses qualifying for the um, Omicron hospitality grant are obviously mainly related to the hospitality industry as it's normally seen, but many involved in food supply. Um, have also been massively impacted by Omicron variant, as they were by other COVID variants, and are not qualifying for that grant assistance. Um, I have some local suppliers in the constituency, uh, as I say. Now, when I took this up through uh, the assembly question mechanism, uh, originally, for obvious reasons, to finance, finance advised that whilst they are responsible for payment, they're not responsible for the advice received in relation to who should qualify and that would sit with economy um members may have their own thoughts i'm happy to pursue individually but i thought the committee may also want to um maybe inquire as a committee uh, those involved for example a, pota a potato supplier um mm -hmm. obviously massively impact and, and i myself of one of those um happy to hear others others thoughts um you know, like, uh, uh, just speaking personally, you know, John, I would be happy, uh, happy to to support what what you're suggesting there. So you're not going to come in there on this one, Hatsy? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. I there's, I, I get what John's saying there. Um, there is a, there is a bit of a problem in that the the schemes, or rather the this particular Omicron scheme, it's it's sort of targeted at people that were. Sorry, my phone's buzzing here in the middle of it. Um, sorry about that. Multitasking, oh, Patsy. Oh no. So these were these were people that availed of the LRSS scheme uh, mm -hmm. last year. Now, the sorts of people um, that I presume John's talking about are people who uh, have seen their, and I've, I've already suggested this to the minister. Uh, this is the minister for the economy. These would be people who have seen their their income diminish certainly as a result of being in the supply chain or the hospitality sector yeah. and it could be people um, yes who are supplying food but there are others uh, say for example dry cleaners who are yeah. cleaning uh, table I've been there before with yeah. us but um, the sort of scheme that if there is any spare money that could be targeted at those people is like I think it was the SRBSS scheme uh, or the SBSS scheme Part B last year, if you recall it, that was targeted at business who, who weren't closed as a result of the regulations, but who did see their uh, income diminish as a consequence of being in the supply chain or being affected by the closure of other businesses who were closed or which were closed as a result of the regulations. So I do think there is an opportunity there for a scheme directed similarly to the one as before, the Part B scheme uh, last year directed at those whose income has been affected, albeit they weren't closed <clears throat> as a consequence of of the regulations. Yeah, uh, so a replication scheme, just um, directed at those firms who are seeing and uh, are able to verify that they're in, they're in the the supply chain and have seen their their business diminish as a consequence of other businesses being closed or whatever. Um, of which there were quite quite a number, um, particularly in the, the hospitality okay. sector. So, uh, if I could make the suggestion that that be something that could maybe be refreshed at the thinking of the Department of the Economy uh, Chair, please. Maybe is that the sort of right. thing you were going, John? Yeah, Chair, that, that that's helpful. And as Patsy pointed out, there there will be other um, <clears throat> businesses and industries affected by this, and, and other sectors. But of course, we have the obvious link to um, food supply chains, for example, and there would be businesses individually whose income would have been impacted up to the tune of 80% or more by the very closure of hospitality at any stage of COVID, and therefore they may or should qualify for further grant schemes or extended grant schemes. Yeah. 
Thank you, mate, John. Uh, can I say? Yes, William. I can fully understand where you're coming from in relation to that. Uh, the difficulty uh, I see is difficult to administrate that sort of a scheme, uh, given that John said about the potato supplier being affected, and that, that could be absolutely right, but there's other potato suppliers that are affected that were supplying, say, chippies and all weren't, effect, weren't affected at all. So it, it is, while I fully understand where you're coming from, and think we should make representation, I do know that that sort of a scheme is quite difficult because it, yeah. it has to be individualised type of thing, so it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, totally accept that. But it has been done before and was done before. So we're talking about a refreshing of that scheme. They know how to do it. It has been done before. And the onus in instances where the income has reduced a bit, the onus of proof lies with the applicant, as it did before. Yeah, so, yeah. So, do, am I right in saying that there's consensus to make representation to the Department of Conway? And then I read, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll see what they say and we get the correspondence back. Okay, members. Thank you, Chair, and th thanks to the others. No problem. Okay, members. Um, so, the next committee meeting takes place next Thursday, the 24th of February, and at 10 a.m. it'll be a hybrid meeting and streamed on the Assembly website. Members, don't hit the leave button yet uh, because uh, we have a bit of. Uh, we have a bit of consideration work to do on our women and farm management uh, um, survey and a few other bits and pieces. So I want to just thank the public who have tuned in this morning uh, to the committee, and we hope to hopefully tune back in again next week. And uh, can we get the spotlight or the turned off now, and then members just stay on just for a short while to discuss some of the items in the closed session. <laughs> This is the Northern Ireland.